Oi, what's the best game where you get to eat pie? Oi, what's the best game where you play a dead guy? Aye? You'll find I'm in DJ 247's podcast. Here, what's the best game where you swing from a rope? And what's the best game where you battle the pole? Like I said, you will find out in this your podcast. Hello and welcome to VG247's Best Games Ever podcast, where we attempt to find the best game within an extremely specific category that we have expertly devised in order to get people to click on our website so we don't starve. But no matter how well we do at the SEO game, we are unfortunately starving anyway because of a man called Todd Howard. Uh, Now, Todd is a man, a lovely man, a really nice man, but um, he is incapable of shipping a game in under a decade. And you know what? Fair play. None of us can ship a game at all. Uh, But none of the rest of us uh, are the lead director of basically the most important video games going if your mortgage relies on guides traffic. So uh, this is why our topic this week is the best game to play while you wait for Starfield to come out. I'm really sorry I couldn't write a funnier intro this week. I tried, but in doing so, discovered that the only amusing thing about Starfield is that it rhymes with Garfield. Uh, I'm joined. Uh, I'm joined this week by uh, editor in chief Tom Ory. It wasn't even remotely funny, was it? Uh, no, it wasn't funny at all. Sorry, uh, it's uh, it's, be, it's been that kind of a week, Tom. Uh, <laughs> associate editor Alex Donaldson. Hello. Who is not feeling well and uh, uh, features editor Dom, who uh, is back on the podcast after a very, very long hiatus. <laughs> this is your first appearance since episode two, which was six months ago. Hi. Uh, I hope it's worth the wait. I mean, if you don't win now, you are you are effectively ending a winning streak. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a hundred percent win rate. I need to I need to keep it up. Yeah, this is why uh, Sharif's afraid of coming back because he's been on three times and won three times, and it's uh, it's unlikely to. Uh, I mean, one of those know. wins was on a technicality, though. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I did I did listen to the disgraceful roundup podcast where Tom just disparaged everybody's uh, results. The, the the hastily commissioned episode where Tom. Rated me for an hour for not for him not winning enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we planned that. We always planned that episode six months ago. And we thought <laughs> been working on the notes ever since. Yeah, twenty seven episodes in, we'll do a roundup. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, you got it quite tight in that podcast, Alex, for for flying to uh, Warsaw. I mainly it wasn't really him. I was I was more his mate that I had to go at. <laughs> <laughs> he deserves it to be fair yeah yeah um all right okay so uh yeah so we're looking for the best uh uh i've forgotten the name of the fucking podcast um the best game to play while you wait for starfield to come out uh which is a subject very close to our hearts as a as i described in the intro because uh until it comes out we've basically got nothing uh <laughs> to tell you about on the website so let's start with dom uh because your one is a game that's actually quite close to my heart as we discussed last week yeah uh i have gone for ftl faster than light which is one of the best strategy games sort of like space space games that's out there uh, i might i'm sort of going back on what i said on the website yesterday in which i wrote mass effect is one of the best sci-fi space games out there so ignore that um but ftl <laughs> it's it's a perfect it's a it's an easy 10 out of 10 for me uh, i picked it up after i played it at a mate's house once for like an hour i had it yeah. on my uh gaming pc and I, it took about a week of my life away i think i stayed up to about 4 a.m for like seven days in a row just playing it uh, but uh, I've got a soft spot for roguelikes and things like that. Like I've, I think I've got a thousand plus hours in Binding of Isaac. Um, oh, wow. So this is the sort of game that just it scratches that itch. It's, you can keep on playing it over and over again, going through, exploring the depths of space, getting deeper and deeper into space as things get scarier and scarier. And then like your ship sets on fire and then you, your crew die and you're like, oh, well, that's a waste of four hours. I'll do it all again. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I think as you wait for Skyrim and as you wait, sorry, as you wait for Skyrim in space uh, and want something that kind of like hits upon this idea of exploration and like uh, there's kind of a simulation aspect of it as well. And like you need to make sure your oxygen's working and your ship is firing in all cylinders. Mm. I don't know. I just think it, I think it really scratches that kind of like soft sci fi itch that you have with these kind of things that I think Starfield will also kind of uh, work, work with. What I loved about FTL is that it really made you feel like 
those bits in Star Trek where the captain is just fucking screaming at everyone because the ship is <laughs> like falling apart around them and, and the Klingons are outside pelting you with fucking torpedoes and you're screaming at Data to get the, the shields up or whatever. They and should have made a licensed version. Star Trek. They absolutely should have done. Mm. Uh, I think it would have done gangbusters. But you know, but then they made like Star Trek Online, which is rubbish. <laughs> uh, so, well, while know. Subset Games moved on to make uh, Into the Breach, which is just as good and tight mm. and. and, I, and... Oh. I don't know about just as good. I don't know about just as good. <laughs> it's very good, but I don't think it's FTL is is, is special. FTL's uh, a it's like a once in a generation kind of thing, isn't it? Like yeah. When it I've, on I've, not, Switch. I've not played it at all. Have you not? It looks looks like a boring game for nerds. I thought you <laughs> hired me on the basis of an FTL review way back when. Really? It, well, yeah, I was saying to Don, like FTL was like the first game I ever sort of reviewed on YouTube. Was it? Yeah, I, a didn't, big, I didn't watch that. There's a big CGI <laughs> penis in the video. <laughs> I need, I I need to. <laughs> yeah, you just made a video about trains, and that's what got you the job. <laughs> 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 I watched the video. I watched it back because Dom reminded me. I was like, "This is I love. I love for FTL. There was, there was definitely a period in my life where I was playing it constantly. You can call all your wee guys like Riker and whatever because you know because <laughs> everyone who plays that game is already." And I watched this. It's all really old time McLeish review. It was the first ever one I did, and I watched it back. And I forgot this, but I recreated the next generation intro. But instead of the starship, it's a giant <laughs> penis. <laughs> So, um, Start and, of a uh, long and illustrious career. Yeah, and here I am now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's largely Tom Murray's fault, if, if I'm being honest. So, um, yeah, FTL uh, FTL is a great choice, and it means like, it, like I think um, you all must remember that period when it came out, and it was like games Twitter was just didn't shut up about it for a solid it was one of those ones that lasts a week and then nobody ever refers to it ever again <laughs> but it was definitely like a solid week of like that being the water cooler game yeah and it's one of the few games of that of that type where when that happened i didn't resist because often when this happens everyone's <laughs> going oh my god this is such and such and it's a little indie game i'm like I'm not falling into this trap. <laughs> Screw these guys. <laughs> but this is one of the few where I was like, actually, yes. Because on the top down, it looks like, I don't know, a fancy modified Excel spreadsheet or something. Like, you kind yeah. of look at it for the graphics-wise, and it's all very blocky and looks very simple. But that belies yeah. its depth, and it's, like, the kind of spirit of it as well. And in terms of game design, going from, like, system to system and, like, galaxy to galaxy and exploring yeah. and getting resources, it's all very tight. And I think that that's mm. what makes it so compelling and why you keep going back. And it's got that beautiful, uh, almost, like, unknowable, like, uh, uh, road light thing where it's like no one more go I know I know it's three I know mm. it's ten past three in the morning but I need mm. to go one more time because I can probably just jump one more system one more system and I yeah. can get my special other ship and it, it just the way it stacks rewards on you and kind of like it coaxes you on and you get to make yeah. your own narrative at the same time it, there's something really just very very tight and mechanical about it yeah and you, you, it does have that kind of one more goal thing where you're like it's just it's a really well balanced roguelike, and it never quite feels unfair. But you, you, you always feel like I almost made it there, but I, I just had a little bit of bad luck. And if I can do it again without hitting that bad luck, I can definitely, you know, it's the only roguelike I've ever really enjoyed because I generally like hate them. I don't like <sighs> any video games apart from like <laughs> four. Should uh, be noted also, <laughs> like a, a, a big good thing about that game, right? Is it was one of the rare true gaming kickstarter successes where oh yes yeah. it was, it was mm. on kickstarter it got backed it got got its money and it came out in a relatively um i mean admittedly a lot of the development was done they did the kickstarter to give them more but mm. still and it had nothing to do with tim schaefer <laughs> so you know it still as, still looks like a game for nerdy dreams uh, it also <laughs> kicked off it, the career of ben Prunty. amazing soundtrack yes exactly. amazing soundtrack. Oh, yeah, Lovely soundtrack. i've got that soundtrack yeah. on vinyl yeah, yeah same God, here. Yeah. And then that, and Into the Breach as well, which is the same guy. And the both of them just, they just work really, really well at what they do. Perfect, like, mm. background work in music because it's just, it's designed to keep your brain ticking over, but not be too intrusive. And I think it's all part of the yeah. magic that feeds into keep that game, just keeping its claws in your cortex and just, like, yeah. keeping you drawn in. I don't like the way that, that Jim is kind of 
liking this and also how he's attached Star Trek to it. I feel quite... <laughs> I feel like this is already... Like, there's already a clear winner in this Oh, one. what is it? With, with James Billcliff and, and, and his wife, Izzy, talking about, like, the meta game of, like, appealing to Jim Trinker's fucking... Mm. <laughs> childhood or whatever it becomes this sort of like uh, it becomes these emotional mind games about tugging on my specific heart, heart. and th- after he said that this podcast has become like some kind of nightmare for me like a real like existential sort of uh hellscape where people just hold up mirrors to bits of me that i didn't know existed um on the uh, i've got a, a wee discord channel that a bunch of people hang out in who like me i know it's uh sounds too good to be true but it, uh, and um in there a couple of them have started talking about this podcast and the chat has started uh referring to like the fucking meta game um, as described by James. So like that has, even by coming on the podcast and describing the podcast in those terms, he has changed the game, uh, which is, is terrifying. It's like we're in a whole new phase. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, all right. So next up, uh, take a minute, because I know... Like, yeah, I apologize, Jim, for the amount of editing uh, you'll have to do, and I'll say this to the audience. Uh, I'm a little bit poorly at the minute, so... Um talking for a stretch of time is a challenge but let's give it a go and test jim's editing skills so when i was thinking about this um a few things popped to mind actually to be honest dom's pick did come up in my thoughts um dom also mentioned mass effect that came up in my thoughts but i decided to pick the game that like seems to be most aligned with what starfield is going to be in terms of how it's new and different to Bethesda games, typical Bethesda games, and that, um, of course, is No Man's Sky. Mm. So the interesting thing about No Man's Sky is um, I did not have a pleasant relationship with that game when it first came out. Um, The way we used to work stuff on VG247 then, and it's quite similar now really, is oftentimes someone will take a game to view it and they will do the review and... uh, a bunch of like guides for launch day and stuff like that. But then they will step away and go and work on other things to detox a bit and other people will pick up the guides. So in the case of No Man's Sky, um, I think Kirk had reviewed it. um, And then I was the guy who came in after Kirk walked away to keep going on guides and stuff. And, you know, as people know, when that game first launched, it was a little bit unfinished. Um, a little bit all over the place Mm -hmm. and man i was annoyed about it i just found it a (laughs) miserable miserable experience Mm. um truly i hated it um and i was writing guides for this game and i wrote many of them and i despised it um just because i felt like it was an empty soulless game that was sort of trading on these fakeries about uh, a, a generated world and we've seen um We've seen developers crash up on these waves before, right? The, the first Mass Effect oh, yeah, had, 100%. Yeah. had uh, procedurally generated planets, and then they they tried to revisit that concept in Andromeda and had to abandon it partway through development because it, they realised it was too much of a of a challenge. And the weird thing about Andromeda is the crafted worlds that are in there are like procedurally generated that they then went in and touched up because that was the like level of uh, speed at which they needed to develop <laughs> they had to start with procedure generated and of course no man's sky they did it and now we've got starfield doing it with todd howard in a presentation talking about thousands of planets to explore and all the rest so they feel very similarly aligned however the interesting thing is no man's sky for, for all the hatred i had for it when it first came out and the state of it when it first came out has got really really good Hmm. it's got really good and so actually i think that is almost why this is the best game to play while you wait for starfield because not only is it thematically aligned with what starfield is but it's actually similar in terms of bethesda games quite often launch in a bit of a state (laughs) uh, and then improve over time um hopefully starfield that isn't the case i mean they've got a big bonus this time in the sense that they're only developing for two platforms depending on how you want to look at it three i guess yeah Um, yeah so they've got that advantage so hopefully that helps them um 
and it seems like Microsoft's given them more time than maybe they would have had if Bethesda was on its own. So maybe we're better this time. But I feel like there's there's the thematic link there, um, the link between I forget his surname, but it's Sean something, right? Uh, if, on No Man's Sky and Todd. I feel oh, like Sean Murray. Like Sean Sean Murray, Murray. Yeah. I feel like yeah. there's a thematic link between the two of them. They're sort of cut from the same cloth to some degree. I think, um, uh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Does he have a leather jacket though, Sean? <laughs> you know that leather jacket. I, 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 I shit you not. After that E3 conference, I almost bought that jacket. <laughs> I, I loved it that much. And shout out to Lucy James on on Gamespot because she was the person I was like, does anyone know what jacket uh, Todd was wearing? And I tweeted that, and Lucy had looked it up <laughs> and replied straight away, going, "Here it is. Here's the link to the place, to the place selling it. Uh, it was a really nice jacket, to refer. And he wears Speedmaster, which is a great watch. <laughs> but <laughs> enough of that. Um, yeah, the point is, anyway, I feel like there's a real strong thematic link between the two, and I think once Starfield comes out, I think yeah. there's going to be a lot of conversations about Starfield." versus no man's sky because the way i see it from the way that game has been presented so far Mm. is starfield is the big budget triple a version of no man's sky where no man's sky was made by i don't know 50 people or something maybe less Mm. this is the version of that game that's been made by 500 600 700 people um yeah yeah, and so that's really really interesting so i think it's a bit of a funny answer this time from me, but I, for me, it's just this idea of, I think if you play these two almost back to back, the parallels and differences are going to be really, really interesting for mm. people who are interested in the nerdy side of video games like me. So yeah. that's my pick. Super nerdy. Wonderful. No Man's Sky, my experience of this is... <laughs> put it... I've, I've, I've loaded it up. This is like, wasn't straight at launch, it was a bit later. And the planet I was on was the most toxic hostile piece of shit ever. Yeah, that happens to me so many times. And it's like, why am I doing this? I can't do anything. I'm moving and I'm dying almost immediately and there's some random bot thing flying around shooting me. I've got like some gun that shoots a rock or something. I don't know what it does. The UI is impossible to understand at the time. Like it was just a mess. Like it was like, I, it's just loads of icons. I didn't really know what they did. Um, but I do appreciate that they've done a lot of work on it and they add... Every month, it's so every couple of months, they add a load of new stuff. And it's like, how are you adding all this stuff without actually releasing it as a, like a sequel and getting no more money? Like, is, I'm really like impressed with that aspect of it. But I've never been able to get into it at all. No Man's Sky is one I feel quite bad about because I was really excited about it when it, I did the review for, for Video Gamer back in the day. Um, and uh, I remember sort of being quite excited for it. And I think I, I suggested, though, um, that... The problem with procedurally generated games, I remember saying this before it came out, before we got code for it, that like the danger with it is that the first two hours are going to be exactly the same as every uh, as the rest of the game. So like it's just procedurally generated jigsaw that does itself, and you're never gonna it's never gonna feel particularly different. There's never there's not going to be an arc to this thing, and people are just going to get bored because um, we've we've been as alex said we've been uh down this road before like elite was doing it back in the 80s you know like we, we, we yeah were very familiar with this kind of game all that marketing hype about every atom procedural and all that utter bollocks they came out with on the <laughs> on the e3 fucking stage just complete nonsense but i, I remember like i was cautious, cautiously optimistic and then it came out and i gave it six out of ten because i was like yeah it's fucking yeah it's it's, it's a it's a brilliant feat of software engineering but it's fucking boring and uh, <laughs> um this was about two weeks before the game actually came out and just got like as you could as you as you know every website gets just got a bunch of hate mail and a couple of death threats for suggesting that no man's sky might not be the game that everyone as sort of imagines it is and then uh, and then it came out and everyone hated it and i felt quite vindicated but uh <laughs> yeah so anyway i don't know i don't know what the point of that story was but look i think it's a really interesting parallel i think one of the interesting things with starfield is that they have a cap on, it's not like infinite universe, thousands and thousands of thousands of planets. They're not trying to simulate an entire galaxy like Elite Dangerous. They're not trying to simulate entire universes. Uh, we're not getting into the territory where like there is more content in this game than a human being could ever see 
in 10 lifetimes. They have got a cap. They've got like 100 star systems, probably around 1,000 planets. Most of those are going to be like gas giants. <laughs> you know, so there's like, I wrote a piece for Tech Radar a while back about how like by putting that artificial limit on the size of the universe in Starfield and having all these hundreds of thousands, it's actually got a chance of feeling like like No Man's Sky, but feeling as curated as a Mass Effect game. So yeah. you've got somewhere in between, and I think that's the most exciting thing about it. So, yeah, I think um, to sort of feel like you're heading in that kind of direction, No Man's Sky is a really great pick for this. Um, Apart from the fact that it was really bad for a long time. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, uh, the other aspect, of course, is building. Uh, you know, they one of the things they added to No Man's Sky is just like user generated stuff. You know, you can build entire towns and cities and stuff. And of course, one of the reasons why Bethesda are making a game that has entire planets worth of empty space in it, presumably, is so people can go in and mod stuff into it. I guarantee somebody oh, yeah. is going to, like, make the fucking Elder Scrolls planet. <laughs> <laughs> They're just going to be able to land on Nern. I guarantee I it bet, within a year. I bet that will be an Easter egg anyway. I feel like <laughs> that is going to be something that is a thing. Like, See if you land on a planet, a planet and, and it's just full of, like, ruins of the Elder Scrolls cities. With, like, yeah, I, I could totally <laughs> see To be honest, I could totally see it. Like, That's so I've got a full there. map of that world. And yeah, yeah it, it's 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 um, but yeah, I, I definitely think there's 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 a strong link between the two of them, and I look forward to yeah, yeah making yeah. those comparisons. Another strong it's, link between them is that everyone I know, anecdotally, that plays No Man's Sky is a massive stoner, and I think that is going to be true of Starfield <laughs> as well as Skyrim was. It just becomes the game of the stoners. Yeah, very likely. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, okay, Tom. Hmm. Uh, so this is this is your. He's got two really good picks here. So this is your moment to shine. Yeah, I mean, I was listening to what Bill Cliff was saying, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> and he, I think he has a good. He, he makes some good points. So I was thinking, like, what is the what is the perfect Jim Trinker game for this yeah. topic? I was thinking, right, he loves Star Trek, right? Uh huh. It's got to be. So I was thinking Star Trek game. I thought. What else does he love? He loves Voyager. He really loves Voyager, right? Everyone loves Star Trek Voyager, yeah? He's not my favourite, but... Uh, you like it, right? You like Voyager. It's like, better than... It's better I'm than, the Voyager lover. I it's like, better I, than... I like back. aspects of Voyager. It sounds like you're so, on a loser already, Tom. So I, thought, I, thought, oh, I thought Star Trek Voyager Elite Force, right? Just because it's a Star Trek game and it's I do sci-fi. love that game. But I thought, no, it doesn't really feel like starfield much does no, it? Other no, than, like, no you might like it and it's sci-fi no then i thought about planet hopping uh-huh. and stuff and then i thought a really good game with planet hopping and space exploration and landing on planets and all that kind of stuff is starlink by ubisoft which i think got a bit of a mm. bit of a raw deal in that Ooh. no one really because it was a, like a toys game a game yeah. with all the toys it got written off a lot i think as like a bit of a naff game that they sell toys for the fact is the toys for it are really good but mm. the ships are really good and the models are all really excellent and stuff and the game is a lot of fun in terms of like the it's a, it's basically a shooter but when you're in a little spaceship and it, you've got the on land stuff and you've got the space stuff i thought no not really a jim trinker game so then i thought right what is the God, game how many more twists are there gonna be in there? <laughs> there's a lot of twists so i thought I, I starfield, thought, oh, by the, starfield starlink by the way the best Star Fox game in 25 mm-hmm. years. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. It's yeah. very good. It's you very have good. to get the you, Switch version. And you can probably still... It was available for like under a fiver at one point, the base yeah. kit. So yeah, yeah. Even yeah. though we're not choosing that Starlink game, you should get that because it is good. Um, and after lots of thought and like I did lots of uh, <laughs> spreadsheets and sort of analysing stuff, I just thought, right... The Bill Cliff effect. Yeah. And then yeah. I spoke to my wife... My children <laughs> and, I, and my, my neighbor is a big fan, so I spoke to my neighbor and um, they said, Yeah, a Morrowind. So I just, that's it. <laughs> Jesus. Fair enough, yeah. Yeah, yeah that works. It's yeah. Not even, I don't even like Morrowind that much. <laughs> I find, I mean, on the Xbox, which when I played it, which at, at the time was like, it was a big for a console game. It was a big deal, right? It felt oh, yeah, quite yeah. ahead yeah. of the, the time. And the Xbox had a few games like that that you thought PS2 could never handle this. 
yeah, yeah, the yeah, Xbox 100%. barely handled it, to be fair. Yeah, the, the Xbox um, used to reboot itself during loading screens, didn't yeah. it? So, <laughs> to flush the memory. That was a thing it, that came out a few years back. It was, um, I mean, as a game, it's got no space travel in it. It's got, it hasn't got any no. spaceships or anything. It's not no. sci-fi in any <laughs> no. shape or form. No. But it is a game that you like a lot, Jim. And it's an RPG. It's, it is a game I like a lot. Yeah. And you can probably <laughs> you could probably say you probably get excited because it runs in 4K on an Xbox Series X, right? Uh, yeah, I do get excited about that. It does look it does look quite nice on <laughs> that. See, I don't like. I mean, people at this point, people would be screaming about how the optimal way to play Morrowind now is by spend getting the PC version and spending about three weeks modding mm. it, installing <laughs> about twenty different graphics mods and upgrades and. Uh, you know NPC schedules and and uh, quality of life updates and tweaks and everything else. And, and the way you play Morrowind now, uh, ever since probably around two thousand and nine, is that you do that. You spend three weeks getting it looking and running beautifully, and then you just don't play it. Mm. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, and and probably. Um, it is interesting because every game since Morrowind, every Bethesda game since Morrowind has been a version of Morrowind. Like you can absolutely look at Fallout 4 and go, that's Morrowind, except you've got guns that's, and a wane. That's my real thinking here is that this yeah. was the this was like the blueprint for yeah. a lot of future Bethesda games, right? Yeah, 100%. And then, Star- and then Starfield. So if you want to get like how mm. they got to Starfield, this is a good game to play, right? Because it kind of gives you the the kind of route to where they got to now yeah, like yeah. the journey like the space journey that they went on <laughs> to get yeah. to starfield um and you don't have to play the other ones because they're all basically just a version of morrowind yeah whereas this is like they're actually trying to do it looks like they're trying to do something a bit different mm. um so it, basically well, the games well, that bethesda have made are the games yeah. before morrowind which i don't know my name's daggerfall is yeah, that one of them. Daggerfall. The other yeah, ones. Yeah. The yeah. other ones. Well, what, what I think what Bethesda. Uh, I mean, this is not quite what they uh, they've ever said, uh, but I think essentially what Bethesda set out to do was to, you know, that famous Edge thing about Doom. Like, I just wish I could talk to the monsters. Essentially, Arena is. Uh, like that essentially it's it's like a doom game where you can actually talk to entities within it mm. daggerfall takes the idea further and then you eventually get to it. but i think what's where you get how you get to starfield is that you've got um is it pete hines is that his name mm-hmm. bethesda and, yeah, and he's todd the big howard. marketing boss guy, yeah, yeah yeah but you've got like todd howard and you saw a lot of this in the marketing for fallout 76 uh todd howard is a person who grew up in the USA at basically the height of its power and sort of just on the tip of the decline in the 70s, um, around the time of the bicentennial, which would have been mm-hmm. a huge thing in the minds of uh, Americans of his age, uh, where essentially American exceptionalism was just was in vogue. Uh, and they had all these amazing kind of recent triumphs to look to uh, about how their society was the pinnacle of human civilization, like, you know, winning the Second World War and putting a man on the moon and and just doing capitalism better than anyone else, which is, you know, uh, debatable as to how, uh, whether or not that's a boon for everyone. But like, and that's how you, that is literally how you get to Starfield because you, 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 you start off with, I love Dungeons and Dragons. And then I also <laughs> like, I remember growing up in the seventies and then NASA sort of adoration. And then, and then you get to Starfield. Anyway, I I'm definitely gonna, think I'm, this is a game. You are right. I definitely yeah. think this is a game where Todd in particular is almost, it's gotta be an area of great personal. It's like yeah, I said, yeah. um, I mentioned him wearing Speedmaster earlier for people who aren't watch wankers. Um, so that's Speedmaster watch, is 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 the the only watch that was ever yes. certified for space flight. It was the watch that they wore on yeah. the moon. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah. So the fact that he owns one of those says something. Yeah. Um, Great. Like, like, what we're saying here is that Morrowind is a good choice, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's what that long speech about American yeah. history was basically saying. Yeah. 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 And uh, and then we had a little bit of Steve Burns chat, which. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you, if you if you want to do a podcast about American exceptionalism, you should invite him on. Nobody which we, knows which who we're that not is. gonna. Nobody knows. We've got to stop the in jokes. 
<laughs> They're like, who's Steve Burns? <laughs> Simpsons. Some gays, really. <laughs> um, isn't isn't right. he the guy that wrote Spin You Right Round Like a Record? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, this has been a nice, lively discussion about the life and times of Todd Howard. Right. So uh, I need to pick something now. I'm going to play that jingle that Tom doesn't like, which means <laughs> signifies that I have to pick something. <laughs> Uh, three absolutely wonderful choices. I mean, Tom's is a bit basic, if I'm being honest, but oh, three <laughs> wonderful choices nonetheless. Uh, honestly, I think uh, I think Starlink would have been the better pick, Tom. If, uh, yeah, but you wouldn't have picked that. You wouldn't have gone with that. I mean, you, I'm not, but I'm not going to go with Morrowind you'd, either. You'd have gone like, <laughs> I mean, more like let's let's just look at this, right? FTL, uh-huh. yeah, it, like it, it looks like it was drawn by a child, right? <laughs> Doesn't. <laughs> Looks like it's drawn by a child. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, no Man's Sky was yeah. assen- is a se- was essentially like unplayably boring for a long time. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> and like I tried to play it. I gave it a go, and it was yeah. just impo- impossible. Uh, like the learning curve was ridiculous. Uh, the the inventory was a mess. Not good. Maybe now it's brilliant. I do, like I said, I do think they've done a great job updating yeah. it, and that's incredible what they've done with it. And then Morrowind, <laughs> a much loved classic, right? Which that you is, hate. That set the like that basically laid down the the building blocks to all future Bethesda games. Which yeah. as a game to play I mean, before you, Starfield, you could argue that makes Morrowind, sense to play. Morrowind alongside Kotor, basically. Uh, are basically the progenitors of of the big budget AAA console mm. RPG. Um, you could definitely make that argument, but Morrowind still isn't going to win. Kotor um, would have been a great pick, actually. That's a yeah, Kotor would have been, been fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Tom didn't think of it, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love uh, No Man's Sky is a great pick. Um, I'm I'm surprised nobody came up with Outer Worlds because if I was a contestant, I've I've started to think about what I would pick if I was a contestant. I think I would have gone with Outer Worlds and Mm. definitely lost. Um, No Man's Sky is a great pick. Uh, Yeah, in a in a very similar vein, and I think I think what you're going to get is that like if you have a continuum of these things about how to do a space game, you've got Mass Effect at one end where you do it all with character and narrative and the size of the universe is just implied by people looking out of windows and stuff. And then you've got, on the other end of the scale, you've got No Man's Sky, as we discussed, which is just like you just try and generate everything with an algorithm and you have to like send little robots out into it to make sure it's working because people, no human person could ever play test it. And then you've got Starfield, which looks like it's going to hit right smack bang in the middle of those two extremes, which I find fascinating, but No Man's Sky is terrible. Um, so I'm going to have to... <laughs> it's better now. So it's better, yeah, it's better now, but you only get you only get one shot to make an impression, don't you? Uh, certainly Is that an Eminem lyric? Um, no. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> it's got a great scansion. Um, um, and, uh, and FTL is... Uh, FTL is the kind of game and where basically it makes you feel like a starship captain it makes you feel the thrill of exploring uncharted uh territory in space it, it it's it's got the it's got that wonderful star trek factor uh it's nothing like any any of the bethesda games uh but uh i think it scratches a very similar itch and uh, anytime you mention it, a bunch of people in the room go, "Oh yeah, I loved FTL for that week." So uh, <laughs> I think I think FTL's got it. So Dom, I, 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 and I was determined. Actually, I was determined. I was determined for this not to happen because I was like, "Oh, it'd be a nightmare if Dom just comes on every six months, wins, and fucks <laughs> off again." But unfortunately, I have to say. <laughs> Unfortunately, once again, he's nailed it. And uh, yeah, Who knew that uh, Pokemon FTL. Conquest and FTL would be the, uh, <laughs> the, the keys that unlock this door. Look, at least those are like actually beloved and like well-regarded games. Bill Cliff has won with some absolute shite. Yeah, Bill Cliff is a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't be mad about losing to FTL because as soon as you said it, I was like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> 
Whereas, um, <laughs> Bill Chris won with like PSP games that nobody's heard of. <laughs> <laughs> he's just very good. He's just he must be brilliant in in job interviews. Bill Cliff. It's just he's just incredibly like good at bullshitting. And like I've listened to stuff when we did the recap episode last week. I listened to some of the things that Bill Cliff has won with, and I'm like, what was I thinking? This is horseshit. <laughs> but anyway, uh, all right, lovely. <laughs> well, thanks very much for listening, everyone. Please uh, leave us a five star review on uh, the podcast app of your choice because uh, we we need five star reviews to keep this going because uh, if 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 we ever get a four star review, we have to cancel the podcast. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's in my contract. We're up, to, we're up to forty now on Apple. Yeah, lovely. Really? Yeah. Yeah. We need yeah. to what we need is. We, we need five-star reviews that you don't even have to write anything. Just give us five stars. But if you do write something, please do mention how well I host it. <laughs> and, uh, and then what you need to do is uh, go and give the Eurogamer podcast like three, not too harsh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, go for it, put your foot down, you know what I mean? You don't don't have to say it's bad, but just make sure that everyone knows it's not as good as ours. Uh, And uh, and from any other network, just give them one. Um, So uh, (laughs) these are the conditions that we need to to seed in order to continue doing this lovely podcast that everyone listens to. All right, thanks very much. We'll speak to you next week. Like I said, you will find out in this year's podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps us get the word out. Uh, we're not just a podcast, of course. If you'd like to hear more from the team, then check out VG247.com for our fantastic news coverage, features, reviews, and game guides. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.